Hello, this is Mrs Piers Dent from Mumsbury Science and today we're going to look at an A-level chemistry practical, how we can determine the enthalpy change of neutralisation. Now you probably already know that this is the enthalpy change when one mole of water is formed from aqueous hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions under standard conditions of temperature and pressure. I'm going to do this experiment by reacting together one molar sodium hydroxide and one molar sulfuric acid. I'm going to do it in a very simple little calorimeter made from a polystyrene cup, which I'm going to sit inside a beaker just to make sure it's stable and isn't going to fall over during the experiment. And then I've got a lid for the top and I'm going to take the temperature during the neutralization reaction with a thermometer. So I'm going to start by putting some sodium hydroxide into my polystyrene cup. Now, if you think carefully about it and the stoichiometry between these two solutions, the alkali and the acid, you'll know that because sulfuric acid is H2SO4, therefore releasing two hydrogen ions when it dissolves in water, I'll need twice the volume of my sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to use a 20 ml pipette here and so I've got the right number of moles of hydroxide ions. I'm going to take two measurements with my pipette. So I'll have 40 centimeters cubed of my sodium hydroxide in my cup. So starting by just putting some of my solution into a beaker so that I can then safely use my pipette. I'm of course going to use a safety filler which I'm going to push very gently onto the end, I'm not holding it down here. You'll remember we don't hold a pet down there because you might break it and it'll end up in your hand. So you hold it at the top, push the filler on safely, and then placing it into the sodium hydroxide. So now turning the wheel, the solution is sucked up into the pipette, past the wide bit, and nearly all the way up to the filler. I can then take that off, put my thumb on, and then looking at eye level, I'm just going to twist gently so that the level in the pipette drops. We've got a really clear meniscus, and I want to bring it down so the bottom of the meniscus is just sitting on the line, like that. And then I transfer that into my cup and let it drain in. Now, of course, when you use a pipette like this, you don't want to blow the last piece of sodium hydroxide out because when the piece of glassware was made, that little bit in there has been accounted for. So I've added exactly 20 centimetres cubed, but remembering, as I said, the stoichiometry, I need to have twice as much sodium hydroxide, so I'll do that again. So I've now got 40 centimetres cubed of my one molar sodium hydroxide in my polystyrene cup. But before I add the sulfuric acid and start the neutralization reaction, I want to get a measurement of the temperature of the solution to start with. So I put my lid on and put my thermometer on and then start my stop clock. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the temperature every 30 seconds for three minutes. So as it comes up to the first measurement, I check the temperature and it's quite warm in here today and it's 24 degrees. So as soon as we get to 30 seconds, I will write down that into my table. So, yep, 24 degrees. So I've just taken my last reading of temperature at two and a half minutes, and I want to add my acid at three minutes. So I've got 30 seconds to very quickly measure out 20 centimeters cubed of my sulfuric acid. So I'm using a different pipette. And again, just going to bring the meniscus down onto the line. So I've got it all ready to go in. There we go. And exactly at three minutes, I add my acid to my alkali. Now, obviously, I can't take a temperature reading at three minutes, but I know that was the time at which I added my acid. And so now I'm going to pop my thermometer back in. And the next reading I'm going to take is going to be at three and a half minutes. Now this is an exothermic reaction, and so I'm expecting the temperature to rise. And so at three and a half minutes, my temperature is now 32 degrees. And I'm gonna to continue to do this until about nine minutes or so has passed. 
Now you might think, why are we taking all these temperature readings? Well, of course, although I've tried to minimise heat loss to the surroundings by using an insulated cup and a lid for my calorimeter, there will always be some heat loss. And so by doing it this way, I can actually take that into account when I analyse my results. Oh, four minutes. I am now on 33. And I'm going to continue to take these temperature readings every 30 seconds until the temperature starts to drop back down, showing me the reaction has gone to completion, all the energy has been released, and now it's starting to cool down as the energy is released to the surroundings. So four and a half minutes just coming up. 34 degrees. So I've collected all my results now. In fact, I took measurements right up until 10 minutes and I've plotted them on my graph here. And there's obviously two very clear parts to the graph. First of all, the temperature which was constant before I added the acid and then the part of the graph once the acid had been added. Now, we're not going to just do a line of best fit or something like that that you might have seen in other graphs. We're actually going to consider the two parts of the graph separately. Obviously, the flat part of the graph to start with, where the temperature was constant before we added the acid, and that was 24 degrees. So I'm just going to draw a straight line through those points there. So that it goes past the three minute point, which is the point at which I added the acid. I've then got this part of the graph where you can see the temperature is increasing and then it starts to decrease. Now, obviously, the increasing part was as the exothermic reaction happened and energy was being released. And then this part of the graph where the temperature is cooling is once the reaction is completed and the energy within the solution is starting to be lost to the environment, even though we've got it in the polystyrene cup with the lid on. Now, what I want to do is I want to work out what the maximum temperature change would have been had all of the energy been released instantly at three minutes and there had been no loss of energy to the surroundings. And the way I can do that is put a line of best fit through the cooling part of the graph. Take my ruler and I need to make sure that my line of best fit in this part of the graph is going through the centre of those points with an equal distribution on both sides of the line. And then I'm just going to make sure this line is continued so that it crosses the point where time was three minutes. Now, if you like, this would have been the temperature it would have reached if all of the energy had instantly been released. From my graph, I can now work out that maximum temperature change that I should have been able to achieve at three minutes. And it's going to go from 24 degrees up to 36 degrees. So that would have given me a temperature change, a delta T, of 12 degrees. Now using that figure, I can now work out the enthalpy change of neutralization. So I'm going to use the equation that energy transferred is mc delta t, which is the mass of the solution multiplied by the specific heat capacity of the solution multiplied by the temperature change. Now the mass of the solution we can take as 60 grams. My total volume was 60 centimetres cubed, if you remember, 40 centimetres cubed of the alkali and 20 of the acid. Um, and we will assume it has the same density as water, that is an appropriate assumption. So that is 60 grams. We can also assume the specific heat capacity of the solution is the same as that of water, which is 4.18. And then my temperature change is what I've taken from my graph is 12. Now that gives me energy transferred to the solution as 60 multiplied by 4.18 multiplied by 12, which is 3000 and that's joules. Now that's joules of energy for the number of moles of water that I've produced. But if you remember in the definition at the beginning, enthalpy change of neutralization is the enthalpy change when one mole of water is produced. So I need to calculate how many moles of water I've made. So the amount of water I've made is going to be dependent on the amount of acid and alkali that I had. If you remember, each solution was one molar, and I took into account the fact that I was going to have twice as much sodium hydroxide as acid. So if I take my sodium hydroxide, the number of moles is concentration times volume. The concentration was one, and the volume was 0.04 decimeters cubed, 40 centimeters cubed. 
So I've made 0.04 moles of water from my sodium hydroxide. Now I could do the same calculation with my acid, but because it's one molar acid, but it releases two protons when it dissolves in water, I would have the same number of moles of hydrogen ions, therefore producing the same number of moles of water. So I've now got the amount of energy released for the number of moles of water I've produced. So if I take my energy released and divide it by my number of moles, 0.04, that will give me the energy released for one mole of water, which is 75,000 joules per mole. But of course, we always convert to kilojoules. So that's 75 kilojoules per mole. And the final thing we have to remember is that this was an exothermic change. Temperature went up. And so when we express the enthalpy change of neutralization, it must be expressed as a negative. So that gives me a final answer of minus 75 kilojoules per mole.